Hello, everyone. Welcome to Miss Info Day. Miss Info Day is hosted by the University of Washington Center for an Informed Public in partnership with the Washington State University Edward R. Murrow College of Communication. I'm Liz Kraus, Miss Info Day Planner at the Center for an Informed Public. I'm so excited to be here with all of you as we learn to resist misinformation and be better informed. Before we start, I want to show you where we're all tuning in from today. We have librarians and uh, teachers and students tuning in from all across Washington and the United States, and even some people uh, tuning in internationally. So thank you so much for to everyone for being with us today. This session is Spotting Misinformation with Dr. Jevin West. Jevin is an associate professor in the Information School at the University of Washington and director of the UW Center for an Informed Public. He is also a co-creator of the course Calling Bull, Data Reasoning in a Digital World. There will be time at the end of the session to answer some of your questions. So if you have questions for Jevin at any point during the session, you can use the Q&A form linked in the description box to submit those. That's all from me. I'll pass it off to Jevin. Great, thanks Liz, and thanks so much for organizing this super important event. I wanna thank all of you for taking the time. There's lots of things you can do with your time and, and thanks for spending 40 minutes or so talking about this really important topic, at least that I think is really important, spotting misinformation and, and trying to figure out ways to become better information consumers because this misinformation crisis that we're in, and it really is a crisis, we'll talk about that in just a minute, um, really touches everything. And if we can't solve the information problem, it's gonna be hard to solve some of these bigger challenges, you know, regarding the pandemic or climate change or whatever it is that we're trying to solve as humanity. So as Liz mentioned, I am an associate professor in information school and director of this new center. We call it the new center for an informed public at the University of Washington. And we live and breathe this day and night. We teach it and we do research on it. But of all the things we do, I think one of the most important things is talking to the public and talking to students like yourselves. I wish we were all in one humongous room, but we're not, and you're all across the country. So it's kind of fun to think of it that way as well. A big class with everyone uh, around the country listening. So what we're gonna talk about today are some tricks of the trade uh, in spotting misinformation, both as a consumer of information and a producer, um, and also how tricky it can be. It's kind of an art. Um, my colleague, Carl Brickstrom and I, we wrote a book on this topic and we, our subtitle is really The Art of Skepticism. It really is kind of an art and it's not always straightforward. And we could talk for days about this topic. So well, let's get started right away because I only have about 30 minutes to talk about all these different things. So as we know, we're all inundated with inf uh, information. Certainly in this age, in your age as digital natives, where every device and phone and computer is pushing information at us all the time. It's, it's, it's really, truly overwhelming. And the challenge for all of us is that a lot of this information is misinformation. And we, there are ill effects of that. Um, and we live in a world where even the pictures and videos and audio that we see are not always real. Here's a game that Carl and I built uh, a little over a year, well, over a year ago. We call it Which Face is Real, actually two years ago, whichfaceisreal.com. It's a very simple game. We, we give you one picture of a real person that lives on this earth, and then another picture of, uh, of, a, of, of what appears to be a human, but it's not a real person, it was generated with computers. And we say, tell us which one's real. So in this case, look at these two pictures and you try to decide which one's real. Is it the red shirt or the blue shirt picture? Well, in this case, it's the blue shirt picture, but this one is a little bit hard. Don't feel bad if you thought it was the red shirt because I get them wrong and I've seen thousands of these. But the point is this, that even the images and videos that we're seeing, um, we can't always trust our eyes because computers have gotten so good at creating things that just aren't real. Now, it doesn't mean we just give up and not believe anything that we see on the internet and online. It just means you have to be aware that there is this technology out there now and you can create it quite easily and cheaply. So be on the lookout. We also live in a world 
Uh, so, and by the way, we, we created a little quiz in our center that you can go and try out your skills to identify images like this, like the Witch Face is Real game, or go and play it at this um, uh, site that we call uh, Spot the Deep Fake. Um, this is in collaboration with Microsoft's Defending Democracy team, Democracy team and various other partners. And you can play it and see if you can identify deep fakes. I'll tell you, it's really hard. Um, so, but that's not just deep fakes. You'll hear you, if you haven't heard of deep fakes, um, now you know, but most of you may have even heard of deep fakes. These are these videos of, of people saying things that they never said, actually. They're just sort of words are injected in their mouth and it's hard to tell whether they said it or not. But we also live in a world where there's just simple techniques to try to you know, steal our attention and steal our eyeballs. Um, and that's things like clickbait. So clickbait um, are, are sort of um, links and, he and, and headlines to pull us in that, that don't really give us any information. They're there just to hook us and yank us into some news site or other web page. And we just created a new project recently um, out of the Calling Bull project where we try to steal the, the, the bait um, and just trying to make a point to watch out for all this clickbait. It's just it's just the world we live in. We have deep fakes, we have clickbait everywhere, we have social media platforms that are full of misinformation. And by the way, with these clickbait, here's what I mean by that. So here's, here's how we read stories now on the internet. By the way, it wasn't always like that. Usually headlines were supposed to tell you as much as they could by just reading the headline. Now, read, read the headline from entrepreneur.com here. One simple technique to learn anything. But it doesn't tell you what that is. Um, you can learn this in just four steps. Well, you dug into the article, we can say it in one word, teach it. And by the way, that is a good lesson. Um, if you wanna learn about misinformation, teach it. So you guys can all be ambassadors and you can go teach your parents and your friends and your neighbors how to become better information consumers and producers. But there are more serious ones too, like this one from yahoo.com saying the one thing that makes you two times more likely to die from COVID um, and it doesn't tell you. You have to click on the article to find out. And if you click on this particular article, you'll learn that one of the, um, uh, one of the characteristics is, is obesity in this case. And there are other characteristics or two that make people more susceptible to COVID. But the point here is that there's clickbait like this all over the web. And if you look for it, you'll see it without even really trying. And the point here is that we live in a world, in an information world, where it's just grabbing our attention all the time. And because of that, we have to have good habits of mind. We have to be extra vigilant and extra good at being able to identify when things are more reliable and when they're not. And, and by the way, even someone like myself who studies this and teaches this all the time, actually <laughs> seems like 24 hours a day, um, I get it wrong too. So this is a very difficult thing to do, but we can always get better. We can always get better. So here's what we know about our information environments and, and everyone knows it that it's torrential, it's addictive, it's unreliable, and many times it's insincere. So the, and by the way, there are huge consequences to that. The consequences are profound. January 6th, the event at January 6th at the Capitol um, really indicates how serious it can be when it comes to misinformation and also when it comes to the pandemic. So back in February, February 2nd of last year, the World Health Organization claim, made a claim that not only were they and the world dealing with a pandemic, they were also dealing with a parallel infodemic. There were the information spaces were infected essentially with misinformation that was making it harder for the World Health Organization and the public at large to deal with the pandemic. And really, I, I don't think it's uh, that much of a stretch of an argument to say that the misinformation that has completely infused the pandemic um, and in and, and many different mediums and all over the internet has likely cost many people their lives. And so really learning how to detect misinformation and disinformation, which is intentional misinformation, can really be life or death um, in, in, in some ways. So it, it's a very serious thing. It has big consequences. And really, it's truly up to you. When people say, well, what can we do about it? Should we go after the tech? companies and, and start to regulate them? Yes, I think we should. Um, should we, you know, should we create laws that protect us more without with, with protecting, you know, the First Amendment, et cetera? There's things that you can do in the legal sphere and the technology sphere. There's things that we can do in the research sphere, but nothing is more important than having us, us, all of us on the internet stop from 
from sharing of this as much as we can. So really, we always say, think more, share less. If we do a little bit less sharing and a little bit more thinking, we can really truly start to have an effect. In fact, if you go to the World Health Organization, when they talk about this, they have this great graphic that shows the effect you could have if you wouldn't share that rumor or that falsehood that, that we know is at least retrospectively is false. But here you see someone that didn't send a rumor through that group chat and look at all the people that didn't get infected with that misinformation. This person at least checked it here, checked their facts and stopped spreading it. But these individuals maybe here kept letting that thing explode and amplify. So every individual can have a large effect. Some people say, well, I don't have that many followers. I, I wouldn't have that much effect. You can because of the way that the, the, the world of information is connected and, and because of the, what we call the high degree. So every person really does has connections to a, a large number of individuals that can amplify quickly in a network, even if you don't have as many followers as um, you know, LeBron James or, or President Biden or whatever. But, but you can still have a major, major um, impact by, by slowing the spread of misinformation. And there's all sorts of tips. You, you know, I'm sticking with World Health, Health, World Health Organization. It's kind of the theme a little bit today, just to say, you know, these are the kinds of sources that are reliable. There are all sorts of things you're going to read about media literacy. And I'm hoping that we're going to start seeing more and more media literacy and critical reasoning type um, assessments and exercises in school curriculum happening more often because it's something we all have to deal with. And this shouldn't just be in schools. It should be in the public writ large. But there are things that we look for. So, of course, we should be assessing the source. So anytime you come across a new website or new site that you haven't seen, that you should be trying to assess, you know, when was this source founded? Are they reliable? Have they been fact checked a lot? You know, who owns it? Where is the money that funds it? These kinds of questions. Now, you can't do that for every source you ever come across. But if you come across something that you're thinking of sharing or it's a pretty on a pretty serious topic that could have an impact on on, on human society or on the planet or whatever it is, then we have to be extra careful with those sources. And we need, of course, to go beyond the headline. We all, all are guilty of just reading headlines and then sharing sometimes, um, but we need to be digging into those articles a little bit more before we share, at least when we can and we have the time to do it. We need to identify the author, which is similar a little bit to the source. We need to check the dates, examine the supporting evidence. We need to corroborate and triangulate and see what other places are saying. We need to check our biases. Now that's really, really hard. We all have biases and there's this concept called confirmation bias. And that is we, end, we tend to sort of gravitate towards information and create these ecos information ecosystems around us that kind of reflect what we think of the world. We like to hear things that we think we, we, we know about the world and the stories and the narratives of the world. And we have to check that, that sometimes just, and it doesn't mean we can fully correct for those biases. We have these biases, but to be, at least be a little self-reflective. Now we don't have time to go into detail about confirmation bias um, and some of the cognitive elements of this issue, but just know that there is this really important part of this challenge as well, which is our biases. And we also need to use the resources on the web, like turning to fact checkers. There's lots of great fact checking organizations out there that do a lot of this work for us. So if you see something suspicious and it doesn't seem right and it's being shared a lot, see if one of the fact checkers around the country or even internationally have done some work um, debunking it. So these are some of the basic things. But what I want to do today is kind of turn your attention to misinformation that comes wrapped in another form. And that's in data and data and graph data graphics and percentages and numbers and algorithms it's an area that i spend most of my time thinking about when it comes to misinformation you certainly should follow all these things and the many other things that are out there and if we had five hours to go through all of them we would but i'm going to stop there and switch you to thinking to another kind of misinformation and that's misinformation that comes in things like this and many times it's not nefarious sometimes it is um, but this is the type of misinformation that that kind of gets a free pass sometimes if someone sees numbers or data graphics or a table or a line graph like this they go ah must be true numbers carry this authority it seems replicable and it, it sort of almost comes straight from nature but we i and my colleague carl Bergstrom, want everyone to question numbers in the same way it doesn't mean that numbers are wrong all the time it just means you should question them so let's look at this particular graph 
So this says that carbon di dioxide emissions from global fossil fuel industrial processes have kind of stabilized. You can even see the text here. Over the past few years, carbon dioxide emissions worldwide had stabilized relative to previous decades. Now, that may be true. And, th and this website, by the way, doesn't have any left or right leaning um, uh, you know, elements to what they're doing. So many websites do. They're either left leaning or right leaning. This is, as far as I can tell, they just sell data. But it does look suspicious when you look at um, the data itself. If you look at the x-axis, you'll see that the tick marks here are in increments of 30 years, 1751, 1781, et cetera. And then all of a sudden it switches from 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016. Now, as I tell my students in my university classes, if you allow me to manipulate, change the x-axis or y-axis or change the bins of a histogram, I can tell any story that I want. Um, and in this case, what that squishing does of the years relative to the others is it'll, it makes it look like there's a flatter line. If you were to replot this data with even tick marks on the x-axis, you'd see a very different story. This is the same data, but plotted in a much more fair representative way. And you see this kind of thing on the web all the time. And it's the kind of misinformation that I don't think we're as trained at doing, yet this kind of information is becoming more and more prevalent, especially you, many of you probably seen that during the pandemic, lots of tables, charts, uh, numbers, percentages, statistics all over the place. And we want to teach the public before they get to the university. And, and, if, and even if you don't go to university, they have a chance to practice this in middle school and high school before as well. And that's a, this sort of builds off of, I spent most of my time at a university campus and college teaching there, but I really think that everyone can get good at this. It doesn't matter what your background is or how much experience you had. I think we can all get better at this. So let me, and by the way, we have a class that's got kind of a strong word. We have a non-swear word version of it too, callingbull.org. Um, and uh, we teach all sorts of things in this class because we take it very serious. Even though we use a strong word, we take this very serious uh, we talk about the philosophy of this. We talk about misinformation, and disinformation. We talk about selection bias, which I'm going to end with today, and all sorts of other things. Um, we also have a book. If you're interested, you can read the book. It's for the public. It's not, uh, and we 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 take it a very the the topic very serious, uh, but just with a strong word. Um, but I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is take the next you know 20 minutes or so, and uh, or actually next 15 minutes, um, and I'm going to. Uh, choose, I've chosen a few topics that we can go into more depth of. Now, again, there's many, many, many other topics. We have an entire course devoted to this, but I wanted to choose a few that I think are especially important. So one's about gra data graphic distortions, being aware of unfair comparisons, whether kind of detecting whether something's too good to be true or too bad to be true, and that selection bias issue that I mentioned, which is one of the more powerful skills you can pick up and then it, well, you do feel more powerful and, and you are empowered after, I think, learning some of these things. At least that's what I've seen talking to students. So let me start with a, a virtual exhibit that we did with the Pacific Science Center, which is a museum, science museum here in Seattle. And in this um, virtual exhibit, it, uh, it was like any exhibit you'd see, um, you know, in a museum, but the object of study were data graphics. Because as it says here, few of us um, including myself, were taught in school how to see through the spin in data visualizations. Again, we just assume that data visualizations mean something that's science-based and objective and replicable. But how do you know whether you should buy a story on a graph or not? Well, there's a whole bunch of skills we teach in this and in other, uh, in other parts of you know, our course and also in the book. But let me give you an example. So what's wrong with this chart? Now, sometimes I give you a chart where I don't find anything wrong and I just kind of test you to see if you know. But look at this chart for a second. If we were all in the same room, I would have you raise your hand. But because I'm just looking at my screen, I can't see all of you out there that are hopefully listening um, and, uh, and hopefully having a good day too. Um, let's see if you can identify what's wrong with this. There's actually many things wrong with this data graph. So what this is looking at is uh, the total precipitation in inches in Seattle. Uh, I live in Seattle, we do get a lot of rain. But you can see this kind of story that's trying to be told here, that it's going higher and higher and higher. Pretty soon, there's going to be so much water, it's going to overfill the, the skyscrapers in Seattle. Um, but of course, if you look at the x-axis here, looking at that again, you see this strange selection of years, 1985, then 1993, then jumps 2005, 7, 9. 
seems to be this cherry picking, which is sort of picking the years that you want. And maybe it's just randomly selected. We don't know for sure, but you should be a little suspicious if you see those kinds of things. Uh, and that's one of many different things with this graphic. So we do these kinds of things. We put up graphics and then we all kind of discuss what could be going wrong with this data graphic. Let's look at another one. According to um, this particular blog, it's the only global warming chart you need to see from now on. By the way, it's not, and there's problems as you can imagine if I have it up here. Um, but what you're looking at is actual data. It's the annual um, average annual global temperature in Fahrenheit. Um, and you see that it almost looks like a flat line, right? But if you zoom out far enough, if you can see this number is all the way down here, negative 10, all the way up to 110 for the average temperature of the earth. If you zoom out far enough, you can make any line, even a diagonal line, look flat. So that's not a fair use of, of data to make an argument or to, or to push information. You actually zoomed in like Philip Bump did um, uh, at the Washington Post, you see he, uh, you, if you zoom in with the same exact data, you start to see this two degree increase over the last 50 years, then we can have a productive conversation because we're, we're dealing with a, with a much fair representation of the data. Now you see this in, in industry and at conferences all the time too. You see the use of what are called cumulative graphs. So cumulative graphs are, are graphs where, in this case, it's looking at iPhone sales and then adding up to the previous year. And then the next year it takes that, those sales and adds up to the previous years. In essence, all cumulative graphs go up. And so if you try to make a case that you've got, let's say, explosive growth of iPhone sales, it's not a real fair assessment um, given that cumulative graphs go up all the time. And this is when Tim Cook had taken over. And it's not, you know, other companies have done this. And actually, I've seen many different presentations of this during the pandemic. Of, of misuse of cumulative graphs. If you actually looked at quarterly sales, the story is much different. And maybe that's not the story that wanted uh, that uh, some of the executives wanted to tell uh, um, at this particular conference. Maybe so, maybe not, maybe it was an accident. And that sometimes happens, an accident happens. Let me give you a little trickier one. So this was a, these were, these are heat maps that were produced by the Georgia State Department of Health in July of last year, July 2nd and July 17th. And the story that was told here was there wasn't much different. There wasn't, in essence, I guess, not as much to worry about, but there's something really key wrong with this one. If you look closely at the bins, these are the bins. So anything with this many cases, any county with this many cases would have this color. This many cases would have this color. If you look, those bins change. And when you change bins in a heat map, you, doing the comparisons is really, it's not a fair comparison. In fact, we're moving into that next about unfair comparisons. And this becomes problematic for various reasons. Now, in defense of the Georgia State Department of Health, they said, well, that's what the software did. It automatically did that. And, and actually, I believe them because, again, we all make mistakes in using software or presenting data. But for you as the information consumer, you've got to be looking out for these kinds of things. And there's lots and lots of other things we can be looking out for. This was just news that was on my local TV station about uh, you know several weeks ago, looking at um, anti-Asian hate crime. It's an unfortunate thing that's going on over the last several weeks, but there's something strange with this graph. If you look, um, it looks like it's going down, but strangely, the dates have been reversed. It's almost standard, of course, that the earlier dates and time are on your left and they move to the right. But again, it's not like they were manipulating the data, but you as an information consumer have to be paying attention, especially if this gets clipped and, and taken a picture of and then thrown in a in, you know, social media post or a Twitter post. Um, so these are the things to look out for. Now, here's another example of that, but it's, a, excuse me, a slight different um, problem. Here, uh, the author wanted to look at um, the, the number of murders committed using firearms after the stand your ground law in Florida in 2005. It's a very contentious law and there's proponents and opponents of it. Um, the, the challenge or the, the problem here is that it's not the x-axis of the problem. Look at the y-axis, it's been reversed. So something that looks like it's going down is actually going up and that can be highly misleading. Now, there's a, there's a backstory to this. The author of this actually admitted when people called it out that that was a, a poor representation of the data and said, well, I was trying to make a graphic where blood was dripping and it was mimicking another one. So this was an example, again, where the author, I think, made an honest mistake. And it's, it's kind of a principle that we want people to know that it's 
something called hands-on's razor and it hopefully gets at some of the data civics that we need to improve and um, just civics online more generally that never ascribe to malice what we can what can be adequately explained by incompetence and i'm incompetent sometimes and never as ascribe to incompetence what could just be an understandable mistake so that's something to remember be looking for this and be willing to refute it when you see it but also understand there's a human on the other side and sometimes it's honest mistake now sometimes it's completely malicious um and that should be called out too but gosh a lot of times it's honest mistake and so just try to take that into account when calling these things out all right so let me look at some unfair comparisons this is something you'll see all the time i obviously chose these four things because i think um one they're a little more advanced and you guys are an advanced uh audience you're smart middle schoolers and high schoolers and i think you can learn these things um right away and hopefully teach them to your parents and your friends there's lots of others of course this is all we have time to but let's talk about unfair comparisons so imagine i wanted to do an experiment where I wanted to see whether fresh juice is sweeter than juice from concentrate. So I go, I go to the store, I buy concentrate juice and I buy non-concentrate juice. And I have these number of people in the study. I run the study, don't worry about the statistics. Again, that's supposed to be a little intimidating. You'll see that I did, you know, I got a p-value less than 0.01 and with an exact binomial test, then you're like, ah, oh, must be right. Conclusion, fresh juice is sweeter. But there's a problem with this. Anyone out in the crowd, raise your hand. I wish I could see your hand. Well, you may have seen it. It turns out I'm comparing apples and oranges. Look back here, apples and oranges. This isn't a fair comparison, this is an unfair comparison. And it's a saying, by the way, so this is kind of a joke a little bit, um, uh, that it's kind of a, a nerd joke or whatever, but it's apples and uh, uh, oranges. You know, you, you can't compare apples and oranges. Um, and you'll see that a lot in data and also in just general comparisons and arguments that you'll see online. So let me give you a specific example when it uh, comes to COVID. So my colleague, Carl, who studies, uh, who's, who's an expert in um, epidemiology and has been tracking the coronavirus, saw this information graphic. And this was created to compare COVID um, uh, deaths uh, per day worldwide to other maladies that we, that we typically see on a yearly basis around the world. But there was a problem. This is an unfair comparison. Can you see why this is an unfair comparison? Well, well, you probably don't yet because I haven't given you the date, but this comparison was done early on, right when the pandemic, the wave was just, just starting to go up. And that's not a fair comparison. The way to make that comparison is after the pandemic has gone, it's through, you know, at least a relative, you know, most of its cycle, it's gone through that wave. And here's the data that Carl updated um, over that year period. Now we have a different story to tell when we're talking about the impact of COVID on the world. So it's looking for these unfair comparisons and trying to do a fair comparison. There's lots and lots of these examples. Um, now, one of the great uh, sort of principles that I use almost every day and students, when we talk to them, use them all the time, is to look when something sounds too good or too bad to be true. It can be so useful for putting that, putting a red flag in, in, in an argument. So let me give you an example here. This was a, 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 an article that was written in the conversation. It's a place where academics sometimes will write um, about different research and then they can get picked up by different newspapers and, and they'll talk about it. And this was looking at the age of death by musical genre. So what you'll see here is that individual like like older genres here blues jazz country gospel um they have a higher um average age of death than people that play in metal and rap and hip-hop and that kind of scares parents i'm a parent i have two kids and whoa should i have my kids be playing any music but the blues and jazz and country and gospel well if you see a graph this that has this big of a difference in age of death between genres, even if there is maybe a slight difference. I mean, there's been some analysis and maybe you might see slight differences across genres. It certainly wouldn't be this big of a difference. So you should be, your warning sign should be going off like this, that this is, this, this sounds too bad to be true. And if you actually read the article, this is what's crazy. Here's the, the words that were used. Murder accounted for 6% of the deaths across sample, but was the cause of 51% of the deaths in rap and musicians and hop 
blah, blah, blah. I'll read down to the bottom here. It's a cautionary tale to some degree. People who go into rap music or hip hop or punk, they're in a much more occupational hazard of profession compared to war. Now that's saying something. And by the way, that should have your radar going off. Wait a minute, that sounds a little too bad to be true. And if you look closer at it, I don't have a, a time to ex explain what right censoring is, but what you need to know essentially, it's not that rap and hip hop stars are more likely to die young, maybe slightly if you look at some of the analysis, but certainly not that much. It's that they haven't had a chance to die yet. So people in the older uh, genres have been able to live to 100 or 80 or 100. And when they die, then they calculate, they, they record that death. Whereas these younger music genres haven't even had a chance for people to live that long. So of course there's going to be a difference. And it doesn't necessarily mean the music is causing that or that the genre itself is, is the root cause. So these are the kinds of things to look out for um, when, when doing that. So let me end well with selection bias, and then I'll just end with a couple tips about the refutation process when you, this, when you do spot some misinformation online. And selection bias, of all the concepts, if I could only talk about one, it might be this one. And that's why I'm ending here, because it's so important. It sounds very complicated, but it's not as complicated as you think. Selection of bi bias occurs when people you sample differ systematically from the population at large with respect to the question you're asking. So imagine I want to um, get the average height of United States citizens. And then I go to a basketball game that night and I say, hey, all you basketball players, all you NBA basketball players, can I just get your height? I measure their height. And I go, oh, the average height is, you know, six foot five. Um, and then I say, that's the average size because that's who I sample. Well, of course, uh, that's going to be a higher um, uh, average height because you have a selection bias problem. Um, so you need to randomly sample in the population. But this happens all the time. This is one that I see almost every day as well. Carl and I see this one all the time. In fact, we have an entire chapter devoted to this topic. So let me give you an example. You all have heard this on the new, you see this in airplanes pulling banners and on the radio and on TV, and you see it in your advertisements. It's a puzzle from the insurance industry. That's the way we look at it. For some reason, they all save you about $500. So Progressive says by switching, you save $500 on average. You go to Allstate, you save $498, $2 less. Um, farmers, you save $502 on average by switching. Geico, you save $500. This is so puzzling. How could, it, and by the way, we have our own email account for our Calling Bull project. We even got our advert, we got a request from Geico saying we'd save $500 if we switched. So how can every insurance company be about $500 cheaper than its competitors? Well, let's assume that they're not just making up the number. Let's assume it is from real data. It's clearly a selection bias problem because someone that doesn't switch, they're not gonna switch if they're not gonna save any money. It's those who do switch. If you do take the effort of changing all the forms and going to a different company and all that stuff, then it, you, I would hope it's for some savings. And so, yes, maybe they are saving, but it's a, it's a bias in the sample of individuals. And so we see this all the time. So I was in Australia before the pandemic started and I was looking for places to see all these great birds that people talk about in Australia. And I looked at this map and I said, wow, um, that's strange. They're, uh, they're only in these uh, select places, but there was a selection bias from, they're of course all over, the birds are all over. What explains that? Well, these are where people could drive. So they were driving and identifying birds in these different areas. Not that the birds are sort of just clumped in these different areas. It's that there was a selection bias for those birds. Now we also see this also um, in some of the pandemic stuff. So there was a story uh, going around saying dentists in New Jersey and New York, I think it was, that were saying that, hey, we were seeing more because of masks, we, we think uh, it may be causing problems in dental cavities because we're seeing more and more people come in. Uh, relative, there's more relative number of people with cavities and other problems in their, their mouth um, and it must be the mask. Well, it's not the mask. If you're in the middle of a pandemic, you don't go for routine cleanings as often as you would if you really had pain in your teeth. So maybe those dentists were seeing more, uh, relatively more, uh, you know, compared to the, what they normally would see of people with severe uh, teeth issues, but it's not because of masks. That's again, a selection bias issue. So these are the kinds of things that I want you to think about, but there's many, many others. The point is learn some of these things, get better at it, learn some more, and over time, you know, maybe by the time you're 100 years old, you'll have it figured out. But even then, it'll still be changing. So learn about those things. Learn about some, some of the basic media literacy things as well. 
But what do you do when you do see misinformation? Well, let me just keep it simple and I'll wrap it up here. We want to think more about data civics and the ethics and bringing conversations offline in, into the real physical world. But if you do see things, make sure you're correct. Double check your facts, run it by a friend. Make sure that you're charitable again. Remember Hanson's razor? Don't impute malice when it could just be an understandable error. And I think that's the case a lot of times. So be charitable when you do find these things. Be clear. You're not going to convince anyone or, or, or get people to get, uh, you know, get behind your arguments if you're not clear, obviously. And also, please admit fault. Don't double down. Don't double down, please. I'll double down the double down. And don't be the well actually guy, the person that's always contradicting just to seem and look smart in front of your friends. Spotting and refuting misinformation is about making all of us smarter, um, not just yourself. So with that, I just wanna say again, we have lots of resources. Feel free to virtually visit us uh, at, this new, uh, at our Center for an Informed Public at the University of Washington, and also our partners at Washington State University and any other university that's participating. You can visit us at cip.uw.edu. We have lots and lots of resources that you can look for. Um, and also, I'll just end with a little clickbait myself with the otter here. What is the one thing you should get from your whole educational experience? Well, I, do, I, I sort of defer to John Alexander Smith's uh, speech in 1914 to an incoming class. He said, nothing that you will ever learn in the course of your studies will be of the slightest possible use in the afterlife. There's other things, of course, but save only this, that if you work hard and intelligently, you should be able to detect when a man is talking rot, and that, in my view, is the main, if not sole, purpose of education. So with that, learn how to find out when people are talking rot online, identify it, spot it, and refute it when you can. Not all the time, but when you can, and go clean up all that information pollution online. So with that, I'll end. Thank you so much for listening. I'll take a few questions, but please um, go out there and help clean up this information polluted, polluted, uh, information -polluted environments. Okay, that's it. All over to you, Liz. Thank you, Devin. Thank you for that talk. That was great. Um, our first question you you just addressed in the last few minutes. I just wanted to see if you had anything to add since someone asked about it. Um, this is coming from Snohomish High School. After spotting mis or disinformation, what recourse is there? How do we correct it at the source? That's a great question. I love that you're asking it because you already think, OK, if I do this, what can I do? And there's a whole bunch of methods you can use depending on the kind of misinformation. I didn't get to go in detail about that. But uh, the principles I gave at least are at least a start that I, you, you have to be careful, make sure you do some of your homework. Um, if it's one of your friends, instead of publicly shaming them, maybe give them a call, a, a weird thing to say, a call, you don't even call nowadays, but talking to them one-on-one -on -one or maybe a chat um, and just say, hey, where did you learn that? Ask some questions about how they learned it. Know that it's a human on the other side. And, and I have, most humans don't like to be told they're wrong, but. We need to get used to it more often because we're all wrong at some point. Um, but there are things you can do. You can, you know, if you if you really find something serious, you can reach out to your teachers and librarians. You can reach out to fact checkers. They'll sometimes pick up some of these tips. You can reach out to people at universities and journalists. Um, but if nothing else, just let your your network, your network know, because if you can keep your network kind of a little bit more immune to some of this misinformation, you're making big progress because that's all we can really expect to do. So spot it and, and, and try to talk with a person, try to do your homework. And then if you're wrong, just say, I admit I'm wrong and then move on and, and people will respect you, I think a lot more. But yes, please do something. You don't have to do it every time, but if it's something serious, I think it's worth the investment and we need, we need to do it. We need to have a higher standard of information uh, because that's what we depend on to make big decisions in society. Great. We have someone who is wondering, how do you find out how old a graph is? Oh, that is an interesting question too. You know, um, some of them, will, a lot of them will have citations on them. It'll give a citation to a report or it'll give um, a reference to the news I item that, that published it first. You can go back and see where the data source is. In the world of science, which is where I live, um, they're doing a better job of being able to track to the source. Um, but we're not doing a good enough job, you know, even in science, but certainly in society more broadly, because what should be the standard is that you see a graph and you immediately get pushed in to the direct source of data. So you can check it yourself, create your own graphs. We're not at that state at this point, hopefully 10 years from now, maybe, maybe less. We will, it'll be easier and easier to get the data that makes any graphic that you see online. But 
Um, yeah, it's, it's the only way that I do it now is to try to track, uh, you know, to the actual report or website that created a person, or you can reach out to the author of the, the data graphic too, but it's hard sometimes because a lot of them don't put the actual date, but that is helpful to know the date. And that was one of the things we mentioned. So good job for paying attention. Okay, this is our last question. It's a specific question about one of the graphs. We'll see if we know this. Uh, were we tracking carbon emissions data in 1750, or is that just for reference from that carbon emissions data graph that was shown? Yeah, that's a, that's a good job in paying attention to that. That's a great question. Where did we get that? Uh, since I'm not a climatologist, I don't know exactly the methods they use to infer that. I don't, gosh, um, since I'm not an expert, I'll just be speculating. So take that with a major grain of salt. Um, I would guess that uh, they were inferring those those uh, dates by do, doing cores and ice cores or other kinds of methods. But we could dig to the source and go to that report and see where that data is. And that's that's all we can ask you to do. And hopefully you can do it and send me a, maybe send me an email and say, I figured it out. I went to the source and I, I found out this is how they did it. Because I, I can't imagine at that time that they were, at, you know, certainly in the 1700s, they were, you know, there's, they, well, I know this, I'm, I can't, they definitely weren't using the same methods we're using. I, I imagine it's through inference. Um, and so, yeah, dig to the source and find out. You tell me. Great. Thank you so much, Jevin. And thank you to everyone who tuned in and is watching and for your great questions. A lot of you were asking about, can I get the PowerPoint? Can I get the recording? And we will be sending out the recordings after the event. So you can watch those anytime. Uh, we also had other sessions earlier today, and we'll have more sessions later, so you can watch those as well. We hope you can stick around for those. And one other thing that we're going to be providing is a toolkit with lessons and activities so that you can continue doing this learning in your own classroom. So that's all from us. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for attending.